This is a, a section that doesn't have too many great textbooks on it. There's us, there's BA, there's Weinberg, quantum field theory book, but it's scattered throughout there. And and for the weak interactions, there's Giorgio. Giorgio's weak interaction book are the only ones that really do a pedagogical presentation of these. Nevertheless, it's a big topic. It's basically effective field theory is quantum field theory with the right relevant degrees of freedom. The relevant particles and interactions. And so the applications tend to be uh, emphasize the, the idea of, of separation of high energy from from the low energy that, that you're working. And the basic insight is is that the relevant degrees of freedom are only the ones that you that you produce at that energy. The pro are the propagating particles at that energy. Okay. And a little bit of history is, is that just so that you know the context. I mean, that's why I gave out this Weinberg article. It has some of the history in it. But basically, the 30s through the 50s was sort of the rise of quantum field theory. Ba you know, you start, uh, you start off trying to quantize photons, and then you build up the formalism. The 60s was the decline of quantum field theory, and people moved away from it for a long time. It, it wasn't really clear that that you could use it to calculate anything, and mainly it was things having to do with troubles do having to do with the strong interactions, of, because things like the neutron has a a g factor of minus 1.91. It doesn't doesn't have anything like the, the Dirac equation, which says it it should. And if you tried calculating with that, you g it's non normalizable. You get into all sorts of troubles. So there was a there was a serious movement away. The 70s, however, then was the triumph of relative uh, renormalizable. And so in the 70s ends up being where much of the, the, the material that you find in textbooks was done. Somewhere around here, at least in particle physics, it's Wilson and Weinberg. And so I remember, you know, I was studying out in the 70s. I remember listening to Ken Wilson give these impenetrable talks about he he writes impenetrable papers and his talks were worse. And so of course, as a after he he gets a little bit older, he he decides that since he's so so bad at presentation, he should go into uh, the research of teaching education, <laughs> you know, educational research, so, which is what he did. But nevertheless, his insights there you know, gradually permeate, permeated the, the field. He worked in condensed matter and particle physics at the same time. Picked up by Weinberg. And Weinberg was a, a strong advocate for these, even though Weinberg is also responsible for this re renormalizable field theories. Then the 80s come along, 
and the we go through this growth of effective field theory. And then after that, so by the by the time the nineties come, it's 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 a standard tool. Okay. My my pathway is the following. What I'd like to do is first start talking about effective Lagrangians. We'll, we'll do some of that. We'll do matching at tree level. Where it's easy. We'll do matching at one loop where it's not so easy. And if my my big examples are going to be QED and and the linear sigma model. And this matching of the sigma model to one loop is a calculation that I'm trying to finish up for, for our, the book, the revision of the book. This class goes so fast that I, I'm not sure I'll be finished with it, but at least we'll be able to do a qualitative matching. I hope I hope to have the actual quantitative formulas done by then, but we'll see. Okay, the we'll then do do some more details, so not you know explicit examples, which for for me is probably going to be chiral perturbation theory. Maybe some others too. Maybe maybe I'll do some heavy heavy quarks and things like that. And then some advanced techniques. I want to come back to Wilson. I want to come back to the operator product expansion. I'd like to do the background field method here. Okay, so it's a hopefully a, a complete description. Okay, we've we've started off with this concept of effective Lagrangians. <coughs> already, but I want to present it a little more systematically at this stage and give you a little bit more detail. On it. Questions about wh where we're headed? Okay, good. So. Organizing principle number one. Is locality. And this is the part that we've been exploring a bit. It basically follows from the uncertainty principle of delta x delta p1 implies that that the range the range uh, of of some interaction goes goes like roughly one over the energy difference between where you're working and where you're where this interaction occurs. And we saw that in propagators. The we we saw that the the Feynman propagator goes like minus one over M squared delta four of X minus Y. And then there's terms that look like can be written as derivatives of delta functions, and I think it's, it's m to the fourth, and I forget if the sign is positive or negative. But okay, the other the other thing that y you you know is that if I take a Yukawa e to the minus m r over four pi r, that's the Yukawa interaction. Take the limit of that as m 
gets large. That's the representation of a delta function. 1 over m squared delta 3 of x. Yeah, you, you can just work that out. The easy way is to put the m squared on the other side, and it then satisfies all the properties of, of a delta function. It's 0 everywhere except at r equals to 0, and its integral is, is 1. So that all of these things tell us that the exchange of heavy particles is is local. But it's not just not just the exchange of heavy particles. And that's that's where it becomes interesting. It's, it, it, in principle, it's also the high energy parts of loops. Okay, we've seen this at some level. We've seen it when we did diagrams like that, or like, like that, that those turn into th things in the Lagrangian. They look like a change in the Lagrangian of you know, some del delta m psi bar psi, or or z minus one f mu nu f mu nu. So the the upper end of those integrals at least looks. looks local. But it's even, and, and so let's just, but I'd like here, let's imagine let's do the following. Let's imagine I'm taking some diagram with light particles in it all the way. So, so here's a photon. And this integral of some function of p and q has an integral d4 k, 2 pi to the fourth, propagators, propagators, forget that. But let's, let's explore how it can depend on the upper part of the loop. Okay, so let's put a cutoff So how is the, how, how how does it depend on the high energy part? So you can just by looking at the cutoff, you can see how it's dependent on high energies. If you change the cutoff from from one place to another, the difference in that is the effects at, at very high energies. Well, we know that this goes like log lambda, this particular diagram, plus a constant. Plus, in general, there'd be some function of p and q, which is independent of lambda. And then there'll be things that go like q squared over lambda squared plus p squared over lambda squared plus et cetera. Okay, so that's just general. We see this we know goes into renormalization constants. This we normally drop, but we could keep it. So the dependence on high energies has come down to two things. It's come down to renormalization constants and these suppressed powers. That's actually a theorem. That's the applequist carazon theorem. Or the decoupling theorem. Okay. 
And it basically says that the effects of heavy scales appear as renormalization constants or renormalized parameters. or suppressed by powers of the heavy scale. So that's, that's a pretty powerful result. Yeah, this proof is a little bit more fancy than, than what I just did there, but it's basically that's the the origin of it, the calculation that you either have to get something that is, it ends up being local and um, like a term in the Lagrangian or like these suppressed pieces. Okay, so it's, it's decoupling because basically heavy stuff decouples. There's actually some caveats to that. There, there are known counterexamples. Um, and and the, the one that I think is the most telling is, is let's imagine that taking the top quark mass to infinity. Okay. So that if I take the top quark mass to infinity, it normally it sounds like it should satisfy the applicus carazone theorem, but it doesn't. And it it doesn't because this this limit breaks the symmetry. Okay. It breaks the symmetry of the standard model, which in has an uh, a an invariance under the SU two so so the top sits in an SU two doublet, the top and the bottom, which under this is not being taken to infinity at the moment, uh, are partners. If you throw away one of the partners, you decouple one of the partners, you will end up with divergences that, that can't be absorbed. So this limit is non-decoupling. Okay, and the way you see that in real calculations is you, is you do some calculation. You know, let's well, let's have, imagine the W mass, WZ mass difference. You know, M W minus M Z over M Z squared. There are Things that go like m top squared that that are in that calculation, not like Applecross Carazon would say, which is one over m top squared. Applecross Carazon would normally say that it should decouple, so it goes like one over m top squared. It doesn't; it, it grows, and it's because it breaks the symmetry. The other. The other example is also in the weaker action. M Higgs goes to infinity. And that's basically because the Higgs Higgsless theory doesn't doesn't make sense. It's sick. 
So that also doesn't do it. The, in, in the standard model, there's actually, this only goes like log m hig squared, not, not the square, but that's just a, that's a tiny detail. And it still blows up. But if you took mt and mb, B, both to infinity, that limit's fine. Okay? So, so, so that's a part of the lore about decoupling. So, the, the example of this that we've seen at some level is the QED effect of Lagrangian. Okay. We, we did the vacuum polarization perhaps ad nauseum. We get the 1 over d minus 4 pieces, dot, 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 dot. And we get corrections. So let's let's for this purpose take it. Um, plus q squared over m squared pieces plus dot dot dot. Take it. Take m squared to be heavy. And we do the, the Applequist Carazon works here. We get renormalization and suppress. The other type of interactions that you do, if, if you took, took, take the Fermion heavy, you might, you have other diagrams that could look like this. So there's, there's a piece, there's a diagram that involves four photons in a loop running around a fermion, gamma, 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 gamma. I'll write out what the answer is for that in a, in a minute, but the th that piece is finite, and so the, there's no renormalization. Okay. You can sort of do the. It's actually it's actually not completely trivial. Actually, let's see if we can do it. How do we know that's finite? Um, it's actually not trivial. Uh, I, am not, I don't have all the formulas to make the argument. But this has four fermion propagators in it. Each one goes like 1 over k slash. There's an integral d4k. Starts looking like it's divergent, doesn't it? It's, it's integral d4k over k slash. If this were not gauge theory, in fact, would be divergent. If you did this the same thing with scalar, could this be a scalar? Or, uh, I should scale this that one, and these be fermions. Select a sigma model. That would pro that would diverge. Okay. It it's kept it's made finite here by the fact that by gauge invariance, the numerator has to have various powers of of momentum q. So you know, you have, when you dot any of these momentum into it, this thing has to vanish. So the numerator has to have some powers of q. It can't just be a constant. The rest of the diagram then has to end up going like, so you, so you pull out those, those factors of momentum, and then the rest of the diagram turns out to be convergent. It's not a particularly easy argument now that I think about it, but it's true. And it, and it rests on this fact that that the numerator has to have a lot of powers of Q, so the rest of it, the powers of K can't appear in the numerator. They, there has to be then, by dimensional analysis, more powers of K downstairs in the end. It's a little, <laughs> right. I, I don't have the formulas to make that completely satisfying, but it's, 
it's finite, um, I'll write the, the effect of Lagrangian for it. There's then it, it ends up going like one over m to to the fourth. Okay. Um, let's actually just write f mu nu f mu nu squared. You can you can sort of see that if it's going to be gauge invariant, you want it's not exactly this. I'll give you the right answer in just a second. And then it has to go like the field strength squared because there's four fields, and then dimensionally, four four field strengths goes like mass to the eighth. The Lagrangian has to go like mass to the fourth, so it has to go like one over mass to the fourth. Okay. The effect of Lagrangian is is well, it's minus a quarter. F mu nu, F mu nu, plus alpha over 60 pi m squared, F mu nu, calibration F mu nu, plus alpha over 90 alpha. My notes differ in two places, in it, and it looks looks like they're both wrong. It has to go uh, alpha squared is what it has to be. Mass to the fourth f mu nu f mu nu squared plus seven over sixteen. F mu nu, F mu nu dual quantity squared, and that's epsilon mu nu alpha beta, F alpha beta. Okay. So this, the first term, of course, is the usual one with the pr properly normalized. This one comes from the vacuum polarization. Now, that one you've sort of worked out enough that you can see that one. This one comes from the the photon-photon uh, scattering. This is the Euler-Heisenberg. Lagrangian worked out really, really early on in the, b before Feynman diagrams even existed. But here you see the features for us. This is a local Lagrangian. And the interactions that we're after go like one over mass to some power. Those are the features that we have there. So that's the Lagrangian for E and M below the mass scale of all the particles. If you have lots of particles, you sum over all of them. But it's dominated by the lightest one, of course. Okay, any questions about that guy? How do we get those things? Do we just do out those diagrams? Yes. Yeah. So this this guy you've we we can do you, do you see how we got that guy? You, uh, this one um I can I can do that one because I have all the formulas for that if you if you want. Um this that comes from I'll just write it down here pi mu nu um, equaling um, q mu q nu minus g mu nu q squared of the the renormalized piece, which I actually have alpha over 3 pi, 2 over 4 minus d plus a couple you know, logs, log 4 pi and log gamma plus alpha over 15 pi q squared over m squared. Okay. Okay. So what we'd like to do is to then replace this thing 
apply the matrix element of an effective Lagrangian. So here's what we've done. We, this piece here looks, the first piece looks then like, it's, that's the matrix element of F mu nu, F mu nu. If I took, just take the matrix element of F mu nu, I get this Q mu Q nu, or I'm sure, it's actually that divided by four, so this looks like alpha over 12 pi times the, the two over d minus four type stuff, okay? When I take this matrix element here, there's, there's a factor of two from this, and then there, there are two term, four terms in here, of which it's two times these two when so you take the matrix element. Th that part of the, the brackets just came from those operations. That's right. So you, taking the matrix element of this gives you this. So you, you're, what you're doing is you're matching this matrix element to this result. I got it. So you, you're just keeping the, uh, the seal part, but you're integrating out the, the fermion part. That's right. That's right. So the fermion part's now removed from the theory because it's heavy. The relevant degrees of freedom here are only the photon. So we're writing the, the effect of Lagrangian is written with only the, the light degrees of freedom. The heavy stuff no longer appears. But by writing it out the effect of Lagrangian, you're capturing the, the residual effects of the heavies. Okay, so this first piece is that. And then the second piece here, you know, up to, I'm not sure I'm going to get the, the, the sign right, but it is what the, we had up above there is the alpha over 60 pi. Again, the factor of 4 from the permutations of taking the matrix element, F mu nu box. F mu nu. I actually think, I, I think, I think this and this signs are correct, but I'd have to think about it a little bit better to get the signs. So, yeah, actually, so, yeah, it's worth bringing out. What, what did we do? We, we did a one-loop calculation in the full theory. We wrote out an effective Lagrangian in the, the effective theory, and we matched the coefficients. Okay, so that's actually, that's actually our first example of matching. Okay, and it's also, Applequist carries on again in, in action. We, we get the renormalization and the suppressed piece. Yes. Yes. So you have higher order terms like Q and 4, yes. Q and 6, and now it's like box squared. Yes, Q. exactly. Which is, is almost the next topic. The next. Okay. The only other thing to say is, uh, before I be get to that, is, is if the particles are not light, not heavy, then you can't, you can't, there's no, there's no local counterpart. Okay, so remember this pi of Q squared ended up going like alpha over three pi log minus Q squared over M squared or or mu squared, depending on how I care to, to normalize the log. And you can't, you can't write a Lagrangian to something like this. It might go like F mu nu log box F mu nu, because there's no, there's no natural limit to that. You know, this, this, this is ill-defined. Box can be positive or, or negative the, when, you, when acting on these fields, depending on Q squared being positive or negative. Log then picks up imaginary parts. Imaginary part in a Lagrangian would destroy hermeticity. So uh, that's just nonsense. So you have to then, 
include all include the light stuff. As dynamical. All right. So that's that's the second principle is what we were just saying. is the energy expansion. The, the example that we were doing there, if you calculated it as, as we said, it goes like q squared over m squared plus q to the fourth over m to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. Likewise, when we do propagators, if we did, you know, the the exchange of a W, that goes like 1 over MW squared, 1 plus K squared over MW to the fourth, and MW squared inside there. You know, for, if we're working at 1 GeV o over MW squared, it's about 10 to the minus four. So that we're not too interested in the, the higher order terms. So we, we, we do treat the higher orders as perturbations. So basically, q squared over m heavy squared is a small parameter. OK, so that's, that's that. So what I'd like to do is, is now we're going to spend a good deal of time on the sigma model, because we can do everything by hand here. So the sigma model, remember, it's a renormalizable theory. We have good control over it. The Lagrangian is psi bar i d slash psi plus one half d mu sigma d mu sigma plus one half d mu pi d mu pi minus some v of sigma and pi minus this g psi bar sigma minus i tau dot pi gamma five psi. Okay. And our initial goal is to show that the effect of Lagrangian for that is v squared over 4 trace d mu u d mu u dagger with u is e to the i tau dot pi over v. So this is where we want to get to. Clean that up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so these look extremely different. They have different degrees of freedom. They, the pions are, are sitting here. The segment is also, but it sure doesn't look the same. The second one's non renormalizable, the first one's renormalizable. But we'll see that those those are completely equivalent at low energies, and we'll also, as I say, hopefully do the equivalence at one loop. Okay. 
So, first, just the things that you've done. You've done this, you've done spontaneous symmetry breaking. We have V is the square root of mu squared over lambda, where V of sigma pi is minus mu squared for two. minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared plus pi squared minus plus lambda over 4 sigma squared plus pi squared squared. The mass of the sigma turns into square root of 2 times mu. The mass of the fermion is g times v, mass of the pion is zero, and the residual Lagrangian, if we define sigma is v plus sigma total, is lambda v sigma total, sigma total squared plus pi squared plus lambda over 4 sigma total squared plus pi squared squared. Okay, now Jared's looking puzzled. Do you want me to rederive any of those? Well, I just thought we, we had the symmetry and you could rotate sigma and pi. Right. That still yeah. has that symmetry if it's broken somewhere else. Well, I mean, the, this symmetry, this symmetry in these variables is certainly hidden, right? We, we started out with these. The Lagrangian will look, here. actually what I didn't include was the sigma mass term because that's here, but it looks like a mass of sigma, a mass of pi on with this interaction. So, so the mass of sigma term will break. Well, it's this, it's this vacuum expectation value that, that breaks the symmetry. Can you remember? So this has this, the symmetry is rotations among the sigmas and pi. So we, we saw that out in the homework. And it's pretty obvious here. But if I take sigma to be v. Oh, I'm sorry. I did have to yeah. sigma times that term. Right. So, so that breaks the symmetry. So it's, you have this, this the symmetric piece, but you, you're sitting at one particular location. Is okay. So again, the logic is that 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 you have all these degenerate ground states. There, the you pick one of them, that breaks the symmetry. You get these Goldstone bosons because the 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 well, instead of pointing at the screen, let me draw a circle. So this is the sigma direction, and that's, this is a generic pi direction. There's several of them. But if you, if you, since the energy is degenerate along the circle, if you make an excitation in the pi direction, it costs you no energy because you're moving along the bottom of that circle, so there's no energy associated. That's, that gives you the pi on mass equals to zero. The the nucleon, if you want to call it that, picks up a mass because sigma picks up this, this expectation value. So it goes from being massless in the original theory to massive. And you sure as heck don't see that symmetry left over, right? Yes, yeah. I just didn't see the Ah, uh -huh. yes. Okay. Okay, so you also rewrote this using sigma is sigma plus i tau dot pi, which starts getting us a little closer. The Lagrangian then is, well, it's psi bar. Um, I have a quarter trace d mu sigma 
Continue the Sigma Dagger. That's kinetic energy pieces. The the interaction piece is G psi bar left, sigma psi right, plus psi bar right, sigma dagger psi left. And u squared over two trace sigma dagger figure, she's that over four. And minus lambda over 16 trace sigma dagger sigma squared. Okay, so th this is the one that you showed that we had this SU2 left cross SU2 right symmetry. which was sigma goes to L sigma R dagger, L on the left, R on the right, L and R being SU2. Okay. So, the cover, we're, we're starting to see the symmetry a little bit better. This, this Lagrangian, the, the effect of Lagrangian, will also share that symmetry. It will have a sym the symmetry U goes to L U R dagger. That, that is obvious from, from this effect of Lagrangian here. If I just do that transformation, I get an invariant. It's since that's an SU2 matrix, uh, things work out dimensionally. But the dynamical content isn't clear yet. Okay. The, the particular, the big difference between these two dynamical contents is the original Lagrangian involves fields with no, no derivative couplings at all. It's just constant, so you know, sigma squared would be pi lambda pi to the fourth, for example, would come out of there. This one involves pi on fields that always only have derivative couplings. There's no constant couplings at all. And so part of the goal is to, to get between those. Okay, so let's, let's start our matching calculation. I'm going to do uh, the the one I'll I'll do because I think it works out cleanest pi plus pi zero scattering. Let's calculate this. This Lagrangian is minus lambda v sigma twiddle sigma twiddle squared plus pi squared minus lambda over 4 sigma total squared plus pi squared squared. So Feynman rules. Let's see if we can read out these Feynman rules. Um, pi plus pi plus pi 0 pi 0 All right. Um, yeah, let's, let's. I was going to su suggest that we do this explicitly. It's minus two i lambda. So you you go to the pi to the fourth piece here, and you write the the pi the pi to the fourth in terms of pi plus pi minus pi zero pi zero you read off the right piece it's it has this factor of two uh let's try this guy here maybe this is easier pi plus goes to pi plus 
and a Sigma Twiddle. Actually, the one that the one that we can do in our head is the pi zero pi zero. They're both equal to the same thing. Okay, so let's let's do it. I've got lambda v sigma twiddle pi zero pi zero fits right there. There's two pi zeros, so this turns into minus two lambda two I, minus two i lambda v. The factor of two is that permutation symmetry. The pi plus pi plus works out the same. In a way, you know it has to be the same because this is a isospin singlet, so it should be the same for pi plus, pi minus, pi zero. All of them should be exactly the same, that vertex. So pi minus, pi plus, pi zero, all are the same. If we did sigma twiddle, sigma twiddle, sigma twiddle, that's minus six i lambda v. So again, it's the same interaction, but there's a factor of three factorial from the permutation of sigma cubed, etc. I think if you do sigma twiddle, sigma twiddle, sigma twiddle, sigma twiddle, that turns into minus six i lambda. But we don't need that at this stage. Okay, if I want to do the scattering, I do P1, P2, so this is the pi plus, P3, pi plus, pi zero, P4, pi zero, plus sigma, pi plus, plus, pi zero, pi zero. This carries momentum Q, which is P1, no, P1 minus P3, the way I've drawn it. And the matrix element then is minus 2i lambda from the first one plus minus 2i lambda v times squared for the second one, i over q squared minus m sigma squared. m sigma squared, remember, is 2 mu squared is equal to 2 lambda v squared. This if we factor out minus two i lambda one plus well it's plus it's a plus two lambda v squared over q squared minus two lambda v squared. This There's a miraculous cancellation there at q squared equals to zero. This vanishes. This is then equals to it's that's two i lambda over q squared minus two lambda v squared. If I rationalize this, it just becomes Q squared. And two lambda Vs cancel. And so it starts off as, as low Q squared, I get high Q squared over V squared.
at, and then I get 1 plus q squared over 2 lambda v squared is the next better term plus etc. Okay. So we, we see this funny cancellation. We see that it starts like q squared, that the cr next order correction is q squared. It's m sigma squared is the expansion parameter. 2 lambda v squared is m sigma squared. Okay. So if we were to write an effect of Lagrangian for that interaction, so let's just write out one that gives it that result that involves only pion fields, we'd do the following. We could we could do L effective is well, let me write one and we'll do it. D mu pi zero, D mu pi zero, pi plus, pi minus, one over V squared. The I've just chosen one. There's actually others that we could do, but let's first make this one work. If I take this in matrix elements, okay, there's going to be the pi plus pi minus just annihilate the pi plus and pi minus. That's the same. There's a factor of two because there's two permutations there. There's it's then two. I think I should carry along the minus sign. Let's let's do that. I get the derivative is I P four in the final state dotted into minus I P two in the, the initial state, one over v squared. So if I have things right, it's two p two dot p four over v squared, but q squared is you know it's p one minus p three squared, it's p Two minus p four squared. That's z zero plus zero since these are mathless. Minus two p two dot p four. I forgot the minus sign. So this is is q squared over v squared. If I take I times that, I get my Lagrangian. Okay? So this is a, an effective Lagrangian that's equivalent to, to the first term in that interaction. We can do, we'll do the second term also. They, there can be others too. Um, if I integrate by parts, That Lagrangian there is equal to one over v squared pi zero d mu pi zero pi plus d mu pi minus plus pi minus d mu pi plus. Okay, so I take one of those, I integrate by parts, there's a minus sign flip and, and I get that. Lagrangian or I could have, I could have put everything on the other side. I could have made it one over v squared pi zero pi zero d mu pi plus d mu pi minus. Okay, so there's there's different effective Lagrangians for that. Right. 
we could do the same thing for the, the next term in, in that Lagrangian too, but we'll come back and do that later. Uh, Actually, we have a bit more under our belt. Um, so let me stop there. I'm going to come back next time and do this thing in different representations and then turn it into this effect of Lagrangian that I claim it did by, by integrating out the sigma. Okay, good. So let's, let's do that. See, people came in late. I have one of these for you. And I had the homework back where you come in late. Did I give you? I gave you your homework. Yes, I know. It's Max who was late. That's right. Blame, blame the wrong person for being late. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs>